Well, Merry Christmas. Um, I'm in Buffalo. I am at a favorite bar of mine, a very old place called Mike Thorne's. This neighborhood is called Lovejoy. It's very working class. Um, this block is, is kind of rough. I was um, introduced to this place 25 years ago by a friend of mine from Brooklyn. He was a poet. A pretty good one, from what I could tell. Uh, he was chronically unemployed, nihilistic to the extreme. One day he said to me, I'm thinking of going to Buffalo to drink myself to death. Do you want to come with? And about seven months later, someone told me, oh yeah, Dougie went up to Buffalo. He was serious. He didn't know anyone here. He had no job prospects. He showed up and he started writing his strange poetry and drinking a little apartment here over a diner. And I, I visited him here eventually and we and he, t he took me to this place and he told me all, all of the stories. He died only about three years after coming here, 28 years old. And I have come back every five years or so since then, usually right around Christmas. I don't really know why. It's an odd place. It's been here since 1955. Mike Thorne was the original owner. He's long since dead. And there just never seemed to be any reason to change the name, I suppose. The most recent song in the jukebox in the corner is um, from 1986, In Your Eyes by Peter Gabriel. That was when the machine was last updated. Um, though it still works. There's no menu, but there is food if you want it. You sort of have to know to ask for it. You can only get a few things. You can get a hamburger, a hot dog. You can get a fried fish sandwich. Uh, these are all served with potato chips and a pickle slice in a red basket. Or you can get a big soft pretzel, which, um, you know, these are frozen and uh, heated in a microwave, I'm fairly sure. I've never seen more than three or four other customers when I've been in. I like to sit here and look out the window on the street. I always hope there'll be snow out there. And, um, as I record this, you may or may not hear a, a single car go by on the street. It, it's, it's that kind of street. One of the first things Dougie pointed out to me as we sat here back in whatever year that was, was uh, the pool table in the corner. It's a snooker table, actually. Outwardly, this is maybe the only distinctive thing about the place. Snooker is a, a variation of billiards. There's no, there are no corner holes on the snooker table. It's a game more about positioning. I think it's been years since I tried it. It's, it's very tough. Uh, there's a discolored patch near one of the corners. Over the years, it's it's gone just a dark gray color. You wouldn't notice it if you didn't really look. And because of what this place is like, you'd probably think it was where someone spilled a drink the week before. But it's actually the ghost of a blood stain. Um, a man was murdered on this snooker table in 1971. There was a, a trio of thieves who used to hang out here a lot. Two brothers and a friend of theirs forget the names, and, and something had gone bad among them involving some very low-level caper or another, drug-related. Uh, and, and according to someone who was standing very nearby that night, the one of the trio who was not a brother uh, was behaving very strangely. Someone asked him what was wrong and why he was obsessively tapping his pool stick against the wall. He was holding it horizontally between shots and tap, tap, tapping it against the wall. He uh, had gotten riveted staring out at the street. It was raining. It was about midnight. And he said the red lights in the puddles when cars went by, the reflections of the brake lights in the water, it was making him very nervous. He said if it kept up, if those passing cars kept putting red lights into the puddles, he was going to kill someone. 
and about 10 minutes later he got into an argument with one of the brothers and he, he, he lost it and he strangled the guy on the pool table. He beat his head against the side of it and, and he died. And the stain remains to this day. I think the surviving brother spent most of the rest of his life in jail too. And there was a guy who was here the very first night Dougie took me here. He was at the end of the bar, about 12 feet from where I'm sitting here now at a table in the corner. And this guy began to sing. I, I don't know why. He was sitting with someone. He began to sing some folk song very loudly, and his voice was so amazing, this deep baritone voice, that, that Dougie and I just went silent. He, he sang this entire song, very short guy, maybe 20, 25 years old. And Dougie said, that's Burton, he's from Wales. He's a scary, scary guy, but he'll just sing for no reason. So I said, what do you mean he's scary? And, and Dougie said, I don't know, I can't put my finger on it, but people are afraid of him. Uh, then one other time I was passing through, this was probably the last time I, I saw Dougie still alive. I was sitting here with him and, and, and in comes this Burton. Um, and he sits alone and sits down and he's talking to himself and he's getting red in the face and the bartender is serving him and he keeps muttering to himself. He looks very angry. And then he starts singing again. Um, he sang, who knows where the time goes? Out of nowhere, the whole thing from beginning to end. And no one even thought about uttering a whisper during those three or four minutes. And we all clapped at the end. It was, it was, he was an astounding singer. And he said nothing. He just kind of you know, raised a hand to acknowledge. But nobody approached him. Um, after Dougie died, I didn't come back here for several years, but I asked the bartender who was there when I did if he ever knew of a guy named Burton who, who sang randomly, if he'd ever heard of him. And he said, oh, yeah, he, he, I remember him. He was kind of a scary guy. He stopped coming here a long time ago. They used to say he must have been a ghost. But apparently there was a tape on the shelf behind the bar here for a while. Someone had secretly taped Burton singing Blackbird by the Beatles. And the tape was just sitting there um, for a long time. But the, the bartender never knew what became of it. I guess the, the big story with Mike Thorns is, is something I had to research myself. Uh, long after Dougie told me about it. It seems so crazy, but um, there are people who believe that the bar's second owner, who was a man named Dewey Lord, uh, they believed he murdered his wife. This was back in the 60s. He was never tried for it and never even arrested. They never found her body. His story was uh, he claimed she left him one night, you know, a terrible marriage, but people who knew Lord seemed to think that he did her in. And then the story came about over the years that he had hid her body inside the bar. Now, if you walk up to the bar, you'll see a strange seam on its underside that goes all the way around, down where the little hooks are for coats and purses. And you'll see traces of some kind of um, adhesive, old, old traces. Uh, and if you tap in certain areas, it sounds hollow. And it is. I looked it up. This style of bar was designed to lift in the center for storage. You can see um, where that could happen. But this was sealed shut for some reason. And that took place... Uh, allegedly during a week when the bar was closed, Lord said he was going away to visit his stepson. And when the bar reopened, there was this subtle change. This was about three months after his wife had vanished. 
So over the years, the story became that um, he'd stashed her bones inside the bar in that hollow area, which um, <laughs> it's, it's, you can't, can't get into it anymore. He's, he's, he's been dead since uh, too many years to count. But, but every time I've come here, uh, whatever bartender is here knows the story. So here I am at uh, at Christmas in Buffalo at at, uh, at Mike Thorne's bar. If there's actually a Friday night crowd or a Saturday night crowd, I I, I don't even want to know about it. it. To me, this place is about times like this. It's 4:35 on a Wednesday. It's gray outside. There's almost nobody here. There's the TV is off. I've got my feet up on a chair. And I think you know, somewhere Dougie is looking down and saying, come on, ditch the, ditch the club soda and start drinking. And maybe someday you'll be able to understand me. I could actually go for one of those hot dogs right about now. <laughs> it's bad. As bad as they look, um, it just means getting up, and I, I have no interest. In, I don't want to do that. She came in that day, but then she came in a lot. Sometimes she had money, sometimes she didn't. Sometimes she gave off an earthy smell, like the smell of a grave. Sometimes she smelled of French perfume on a dusty coat. Her mouth looked like a fruit slice, smashed, pushed to her face. Dale smeared a nubby towel over the bar, planks of wood under syrupy shellac. Though it was often unnecessary, he took comfort in the motion. It reset him. She leaned into the lip of the bar and was still for a few seconds. She was ruddy pale, a peeled beet. What's wrong, Layla? he asked. Wearily. I'm scared. There's something after me. He stopped moving and looked at her. This sounded different than before. She usually had a score, more or less. She'd repeat it, the words. And the words themselves were kind of scary, or they were at one time, at the beginning, if you hadn't heard them before. But she'd say them like a script, so they'd lost their teeth. It had got that way, like a show of a show of a show. Like a party on a Tuesday night. Layla, you're okay. He set a cardboard oval coaster down in front of her. What's got to you tonight? She put her elbows on the bar and pressed her forehead to the heels of her palms. She swayed back and forth a few times. It's there, she moaned softly. Tonight's the night it shows up. What night, Lalo? It's coming. Here. For everyone. What is? It's real. It's smart. Layla, sit a spell. Here. He put a spiked cocoa with a tall hat of cream on the coaster in front of her. It's got the wind and the trees behind it. She bent to the cup, curled her fingers around the sides. He looked out the porthole window in the door to the street. He couldn't see much but a little cold blue light, and it looked like the snow was piling up over the cars and the mailbox. It fell in that unhurried way you could lean in close to that seemed gentle as milk, but it would continue through the night and far into the deep morning of the next day, and maybe even beyond that. It could bury you, and you wouldn't care. She got up, leaving the drink, and started moving around the place. She went first to Franklin, quiet and straight back to the other end of the bar. She moved on to a serious-looking young couple, sharing a bottle of beer by the darts. Dale watched her for a while as she circled, as she warned the whole bar. He hoped she would stay calm. 
She settled next to Rhonda at the tall round table and they talked in low tones and held each other's hands. When he looked up again, she was gone. And there was a crash and a scramble from the kitchen, a snap. And when he got back there, a bin of tongs and spoons and forks by the fryer were knocked down across the floor. He lurched out the flapping screen door to the alley. It was dark out there, very dark. From the light behind him, he could see some staggered tracks push away and swallow up somewhere just out of sight. He had a sick feeling grab him at the soft pit of his chest, in the sockets in front of his arms and shoulders and ribs. He moved quickly back inside, pulling shut and locking up the doors. Back at the bar, in the long room, something had shifted. Everyone was stopped and looking at the other door, the front, at the small round window. It had gone quiet in there and airless save the jukebox, which played some old sad wail. And he realized that the window had gone black. There was no light coming through it and no sight of the snow. And everyone had clumped together or, in an animal instinct maybe, cringed off by themselves. He bit down on his tongue. Jars of eggs and dice fell to clatter and smash. A blood sound filled the air. The door was opening in. The town was about to change. Ah, yes, happy holidays to you as well. <laughs> it sounds like uh, you and I are participating in some similar reverent behaviors. I myself am in, um, well, I, I, I'm, near, I'm near the area where I grew up. I'm feeling like I, I don't want to say exactly where I am because, oh, I don't know. I have this... <laughs> urge tonight uh, toward uh, anonymous observance uh, and also I, the reason I came to the area there was a really weird train derailment um, not too far from here that I I've come to I've come to look into and to hear about and to Anyhow, that's a different story for a different day. Right at the moment, um, <laughs> I've come to what is kind of a treasured spot in my in my lore. Um, and uh, funnily enough, this is um, you know of the of the kind of uh, hangouts in the area, decidedly more rural than where you are. Um, this is the 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 one I'd I'd been coming to the the. Um, the least long uh, I, I I feel like I would hear about this place once in a while but it wasn't in my normal rotation it wasn't until I was just getting ready to leave the to leave the area for good that I really that I really started to love it here there, there was always a little bit of um, a romance to it because it it is co it, it is quite a secret spot there is a uh, um, there's actually a restaurant. It's like a oh, it's like a a chicken restaurant. Lots of fried foods. Also, you know, like a very Wonder Bread, very iceberg lettuce upstairs. That it, it it's kind of a beloved joint. Um, and you have to enter the restaurant and then go down some stairs to get to this this uh, beautiful bar in the basement and you can do this from either side of the building and it um it, whichever way you come down I, I i'm always struck with this feeling as soon as you reach the bottom of these kind of uh, <laughs> um uh trepidatious looking stairs um you know it's, there's usually no noise coming from beneath it's it's 
pretty quiet down here. The noise doesn't carry. So it's like you kind of don't know what's ahead of you. But when you get to the bottom of the stairs and you turn into this bar, it's just a beautiful little space. Uh, it's got, it's very intimate. It's really, the majority of the lighting is coming from the poker machines along the walls. And, uh, you know, it's very dim, very, um, you know, it still has a very small jukebox so we're just mounted on the wall with the buttons that you push where the metal flaps flip and, and um, you can still use coins and, and, and dollar bills if you have them. And the, 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 the romance to this place was that um, this was quite a, a raider's hangout back in the day. Uh, some of the more uh, legendary uh, tenures um, came through, came through here, apparently worked in this space. There is still a little spot behind the bar that you can see that it's a dark corner now with a couple of Oh, I don't know, discarded tables and some cup boxes. And Anyway, I have come in here because I was hungry and craving one of their amazing uh, stacks of greasy <laughs> fries and the angelic-looking grilled cheese sandwich. I, I really hope it's the same as it used to be. They would they put this, this um, like, an, an overabundance of... I don't know, like shredded cheese in the middle of this grilled cheese. And so it would it would kind of leak and spill out the sides and and and, and create one of those beautiful sort of uh, orange halos around the the sandwich um, that kind of had the texture of like a like a really thin like a brittle or like a what I imagine like like sponge sugar or, or uh, you know, <laughs> just, there's something very magical about the crystals that the the melted cheese um, uh, develops when it when it um, hits the 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 terribly hot grill that has probably not been actually turned off in in, in God knows how many years. Anyway, um, so here's to uh, here's to here's to dive bars. Ah, well, <laughs> well, wouldn't you know it? Uh, the night, the night continues. Mm. I just got, I got moved while I was, um, you know, after, after my last stop, emboldened by orange cheese. Uh, there are um, a number of bars that are relatively close together in this part of this town, and. They're very easy to go, to kind of uh, go go uh, betwixt, um, especially because all of them have a door that's accessible to use. That's not just um, a fire exit or whatever. Uh, all of them have doors um, at the front and at the back. So what it's customary to do is to enter, depending on where you are, you can enter from the alley or from the street. And you take out, you just go the front to back or the back to front, you walk, you go in, you walk through. If you're not liking the vibe, you know, you see if you know anyone in there, you're, you know, seeing what's going on. If it doesn't please you, you can just continue walking uh, right out the other side. <laughs> um, so I just thought, you know, I just, I'm kind of liking the vibe tonight. It's very cold. Um, gosh, it's pretty still and cold and snowy, and breath is just, um, uh, it, uh, it's almost b blinding, it's just, it's just, um, uh, pillowing and sort of clouding in front of your face so aggressively, and, uh, so I've come to another stop, and I am about to go and sidle, sidle up at the actual bar and back in the corner right now, but this isn't, there's no action back here. I, I want to hear some stories. I want to hear some harrowing stories tonight. This place where I am is um, probably, oh, the spot I feel the most comfortable and uh, the most guaranteed of some intense talk, you know? You'll get into something. You'll get into a conversation 
with somebody and you will lay it all out. And that's what I want. That's what I'm hoping to get into. I'm going to go up to the, um, <laughs> the long pink plastic bar with tiny Christmas trees blinking on either end and um, put on one of their Santa hats they seem to have um, in a box in the middle of the bar for just anyone to grab and put on. That is what is happening right now, and I will report back. Okay, I'm now at my third, well, the third place I'm stopping. Um, stop of the night. I, 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 think, I think this is it. I, I'm starting to get a uh, kind of a deranged, uh, frightened feeling, frankly. I, there, there's a couple of things that have happened um, over the last, I don't know, half hour or so. Um, one of them is wondrous, but also, I guess, if you will, strange. Um, there's a part of the, of the street that, uh, I, I'd completely forgotten about this until it just happened to me now. During the late hours, some indeterminate days, I never knew what train, what schedule. There's a, there's a passenger train that stops, um that stops here and like the, the the street is is feet away from the track you can walk right up to the train and it it, it it will be stopped in a way that the dining cars are right next to you and the something that's so eerie about it is they're always lit so you can go up and you can look right into them but there's never anyone there i've never seen anyone moving about that area or anyone sitting there any i've never seen anyone in this part of the train um, and y you can walk right up and you can see that there on each of the tables there's a little kind of like a fake rose I mean assuming it's fake I mean this can't you know they can't be real I, I, I'd actually frankly be disappointed if they were real I'm assuming I can't see quite that amount of detail but it's like I, I assume that they're they're all like um, it's kind of a uh, uh, silken roses with with maybe uh inexplicably you know those little those little um clear uh resin drops of like you know dew which is just like like when has this even been appropriate on actual roses on tables like it's a, it, i just i so that just happened and i was completely floored and oh it just it just um anyway i needed to um I needed to come in here for my last stop. Once upon a time, there was a little old bar on a little old street in a little old town. Well, the little old town was really a city, the kind that grinds and shocks and chews. The kind of city that pulls your hair and takes your plate. But never mind about that now. Anyway, there was this bar, this little leaning thing pushed down to the rats and the boards that ran beneath the floors of the shops from way back in history when there were still secrets. There were secrets now, but maybe they were just more dull, more above ground, more played out. Well, anyway, this place never closed. It was open all the time. One day a man came in to drink. What'll it be? the bartender asked. A cooking fire, the man said decisively, in a glass. He had a bright newsboy's pep. A cooking fire in a glass. The bartender looked him sideways. Or something along those lines, said the man. Barkeep's choice. Surprise me. I'm in your hands. He poured him a fireball. The man seemed happy with that. He drank it, grateful, serene-cheeked. 
Some days passed. It was summer, and things were loose like a slack rubber band, swole with possibility, with queued up action, but relaxed then and there. The man came in again. He was distinct looking in a way that made you search for something, as if to solve a puzzle. His hair was rock dark and his face like a pillowy gourd sieved of blood. Hi there, said the bartender. What's your poison? A killing fire, said the man. Barkeep's choice. Give me a killing fire in a glass. He made him a kamikaze. The man seemed happy with that. But when he got up close, he realized the man now had just one arm. His coat sleeve hung spare. Maybe it was like that before, he thought. He couldn't recall. It was now fall, and the wolves howled, and the people on the street always had something wrapped around their necks. You couldn't see their chins. Orange moons ached above fields. Some days passed and the man came in again. He was missing more parts. He leaned and slid. I want to forget, he said. Please, you can help me. Please. He was missing his hands and a part of his head. He was teeth, a blue bruise, a sucking sound. One more fire, the last one. The bartender poured him a straight sour mash and a back, a bottom line. Bless you, the man said. I can't go on loving what can't love me back. I've died from it every day for years. I'm already gone. After that, the real truth of the night set in. Colors fracted out, and the range of browns lit by the blinking beer sign seemed limitless and strong. They felt protected there for the night, for a few short songs. Enough red baskets to feed a whole choir. The man ripped out his last stitch there in the steam of poker machines, in the hard gray snow, in the care of kind souls. He spilled out in a swamp, red and pink and cream across the floor, beneath the round stools. Nobody understood. They'd all thought he was real.